Cleo Wortman just brought a load of school children in from the tour out to the other uh, farm. Now, you're volunteering. Why are you volunteering? Because uh, I'm on sick leave and a uh, little something to do why I came out here to volunteer to the children as they come through to see the history farm. Now, you said it's been a long time since you've had uh, horses like this. That's right. It's been about uh, 33 years since I've driven a team of horses. And I think we better go and find out where all of these horses came from. Uh, this is Chet Randolph, and you are, is it? Uh, Executive uh, Director of Living History Farms. Now, tell me about the horses. First, uh, well, since we're holding these okay, two. We've got these uh, beautiful pair of Percheron four-year-olds. They're excellent type geldings. They weigh around 18, 1900 pounds, stand over 17 hands. And uh, don't you think they're pretty nice and gentle for four-year-olds? They're real nice. They're yes. real, real nice. They're really nice, aren't they? Lots of power there, and we take them on the hay rack to take the children out to the Pioneer Farm, as well as we do have a tractor as a backup also. Now, actually, will they be working the fields at all? Not, not this year. Now, next year, we'll have the 1900 horse farm to follow up after the Pioneer, the 1840 Pioneer Farm that we have operating with oxen now. Mm -hmm. And when we do, we'll have a little bit smaller farm-type horse. These are a bit more of the heavy draft horse that's particularly popular now. And the old Pertrin, you know, came from France. And then, of course, we've got our big Belgian team that comes from uh, Dick Sparrow's 40-horse hitch, and they're pretty famous. Now, of course, these are the ones that were uh, pulling the cart. That the, yeah, uh, shall, we, shall we go over right. there and see Doc and Brian? Now, wait, I didn't introduce you properly here. Yeah. This is Major. Hello, and Major. Boy, he's big. And you see, he's going to grow yet because he's only uh, four years old. And then this is Prince. And they're a nice uh, up-headed team that's real good. In fact, uh, they're, they're just so quiet, you can, you can leave them uh, pretty well. Okay, let's go over and let me introduce you now. This is Barney. Oh, Barney. This is from Dick, from Dick Sparrow's 40-horse hitch. And you know, that's the first 40-horse uh, hitch since 1902. And uh, this is Doc right over here. Doc, hey, come here. That a boy. They're 11 years old, but they're just as quiet as can be. The children come up and pet them, you know, and. We lift up their feet so they can see how big they are, and uh, it's great to have dependable horses like this. They'll weigh a ton each, you know. Who's going to shoe them? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not sure, but we're going to have them shod, all right, uh, on Crass Festival time and uh, at other times during the year. But uh, these Belgians come from Belgium, and uh, they're a very popular hitch now. Uh, these were the core and the most dependable horses out of the 40-horse hitch. And, of course, they were in the Washington, D.C. Cherry Blossom Parade and all that. Uh, and we get to use them here for uh, quite a while. We appreciate that. Now, I suspect some children just think that these maybe are nice little uh, uh, glasses or something. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the blinders are on. Now, these horses wouldn't need them, but some horses might get skitterish about what's behind them. If they can't see it, they don't worry about it. Now, but as you indicated, these are very gentle horses. Yes. And when you're talking about the children around, now, during school year, you have the uh, groups. What about in the summertime? Yeah, I'll tell you, well, I was just going to say, do you know, uh, for example, this week we have 600 school children coming groups 30 40 50 coming from several parts of the state coming uh, all three groups a day let's say and then in the summertime it'll be mostly families off the highway and we think that uh, families that are going from Chicago to Denver let's say will enjoy a rest stop here and and they can go out and enjoy the quiet of the uh, Pioneer Farm and then head on their way uh, of course being right on Interstate 80 and 35 it's a wonderful location to pull off now if you the full tour would take a couple hours but if folks don't have that much time, they can walk in the barn and see uh, our ewes and lambs. And, of course, now, did you see the setting hens in there? I didn't see them. Didn't I, see them see I saw them? the little lamb, and I well, saw the, some uh, of the hens. We hope to have little chicks before long, and we set them here. And once the chicks are a little, watch Barney kind of, he shakes <laughs> head once in a while. Uh, why, we take them out to the Pioneer Farm. We think it's well to let the chicks have a few days of age, same way with the lambs, and then uh, they go out there. Uh, so, and then, of course, we have pigs uh, coming frequently, and we find that the children, well, we ask the children, uh, what do you like best? Well, actually, they like it all, including the treadmill. Now, and the treadmill is 
is back there. Well, yeah. maybe we better just take a look. Now, behind us is the barn that the you would barn, see right. when you first come. And over there is the main house. That and you those were built in 1870 uh, by Mr. Flynn. They're quite architecturally uh, interesting. And now there's work to be done, mm -hmm. a lot of work to be done. But we have many volunteers as well as uh, uh, others who are supporting us with uh, funds and with time. Now, as you go around, then you, you have the little building there. Then you have the loom, loom house. house. It has a very old loom, uh, which, uh, again, many, I've heard several older ladies say, now there's one I haven't seen in a long time. And uh, we have uh, spinning, uh, like out at, the, again, the Pioneer Farm most daily. And then when we have our special events, uh, uh, we have the weaving as well as the loom. So you see, we can show particularly children, but I think uh, many older folks like to go from the U with the wool through the carding, through the loom, and the spinning and all. Now, and then if you go on around here, you have the repair shop and the museum uh -huh. and yes, some other things. that's right. And our Pioneer Museum is just a start. But again, many folks have given us things, and uh, they'll be giving us more now that we're more prepared. And this will gradually improve in its uh, display. Now, could I just the second on the treadmill, yeah. you see, uh, when we have younger children, it's a little hard for them to comprehend history. I mean, you know, three years seems like a long time, let alone a hundred. But if we can get them on the treadmill, then they can see that when they didn't have electricity, Barney, just take it easy, and uh, when they uh, didn't have gas engines, you had to use a sheep or a goat in a treadmill. And we put youngsters in there, and they can see what it was like to grind uh, corn for cornmeal, let's say, or for the pigs. And they get a kick out of it, but they learn something, I think, by it. Now, of course, this is all here with the museum and all this. Now, you keep saying going to the other farm. Now, how do we get to the other? And if we were just coming off the interstate, yes, would you, we be seeing the other one? You come off the interstate and spend a little time here in the headquarters, about a half an hour, let's say. And then we go either by horse and uh, hay rack or if uh, they prefer, depending on some of the older folks like to have a little nicer seat, why, then we'll take the tractor or it's a little faster back up. And it's about a mile over to the Pioneer Farm. Now, uh, unless it's tough to walk, we like to let uh, younger people like you and I and, and Les, you know, like to uh, walk across the creek, we have a footbridge, and then up the hill, and as you turn the hill, you all of a sudden there is the cabin and the smokehouse and the oxen and the pioneer farmer working in the garden or, or uh, making shingles or whatever it is. Uh, it's a nice sight. And you see, it isn't just looking because we've, the pioneer farmer is there. You get to visit with him. He shoots his uh, ri rifle, which is 130 years old, obviously. A, a well, why, do, why don't we uh, just go visit? Well, now, that, that's good. That's <laughs> and, good. And, and he's there every day, you know, so we can go any time, and he's, he will find him working there. And so with Chet Randolph, we'll go visit the other farm. We're now on the way over to the Pioneer actually, Farm. Actually, yeah. the Pioneer Farm. Mm -hmm. And we're coming by uh, the wagon through the mud pile. Yeah, we went under the interstate, which we're fortunate to have. And now you see we're in the farm section, a different temple of life here. And as we head down across the creek here, why we're in the wonderful timber area. It's peaceful. We've got a lot of squirrels because of all the oak trees, uh, rabbits, uh, some muskrat uh, swimming there, you know. It's really nice. And then, of course, uh, quite a few cows and calves that look good on the, on the green hillsides. And then fairly soon, when we come up around the rise, why, you'll see the... Hold them back there, Cleo. That's it. We'll see the uh, Pioneer Cabin come into view. Now, this you have uh, as the route that you bring most of the people in. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, next year, we'll add another to the route, and that is the 1900 horse farm. Uh -huh. But for this year, we have the Pioneer Farm completed, and that's our feature. And so that uh, uh, we're going to have, actually, a 50-year span on the farm. What about the one of the future? Well, that'll be the year after that. And again, we want to look ahead as well as look back, which tells the total story of, uh, of agriculture. We want to appreciate the heritage, some of the courage that it took, but uh, at the same time, we want to look at the progress that we've made and, and uh, get an appreciation of our food supply and the farmers who raise it. Now, actually, Darwin has uh, tied both of them up. 
Yep. And he's putting on the yoke which he made himself. The yokes that we had here weren't big enough because these oxen which came from Maine weigh a ton apiece. And they were just too big. And uh, Buck on this side with Broad over there, the off ox, the near ox is uh, Buck here. But you can see that's a pretty good sized job. Fortunately, they're quiet. Now, how much? Here's the bow, darling. Uh, these, uh, a 4-H girl trained these, and they were also in the logging uh, business up in Maine. And uh, Darwin works them here. Again, Where are the uh, pins for the top? Oh, oh he yeah, has them in his pocket. Got, yeah, the, uh, the thing again is that we have the oxen power because it wasn't until at least 1850 that the horses came in prominently. Uh, oxen were dependable. Uh, they were sure keepers, and they had lots of power. Now, they weren't too fast, but uh, they, they were dependable. Were they cheaper to uh, keep? Darwin, were uh, cattle cheaper, you think? They'd yeah, they, graze yeah, easier. They were cheaper, and they, you could eat them if they, something happened to them. Yeah, they, they, that's right. But you could, uh, they, they'd do a little better in uh, grazing on their own. And Again, partly they didn't fuss and fret, you know. You can see how docile that they are. They don't waste any energy. Probably couldn't hear Darwin, but he was saying that they were cheaper. Not only that, yeah. you could eat them if, you, if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, actually, to hitch them up to the wagon, you actually take the tongue of the wagon and put it into what? It goes in the yoke ring. That's the iron ring that's hanging between the oxen. And uh, oxen differ in from horses in pulling the wagon in that the oxen pull from the end of the tongue and the horses pull from the double trees at the back of the tongue. Now, actually, if you were pulling a log, you'd put the chain there, too, wouldn't you? You use a log chain then, yes. I have an 18-foot chain that uh, I generally use in the timber with them. Now, how do you train an oxen? Well, there's two ways. You can break them out as a calf, which uh, this team started when they were about two weeks old. And uh, they're about nine years old now. And then a lot of the logging companies and the road companies that worked uh, great numbers of oxen, uh, many times rough, broke three-year-olds, which is just putting a unbroke three-year-old steer in a yoke with uh, oxen ahead and behind and one broke one beside them, and they either came along or were dragged along. How did you get interested in oxen? Well, uh, we worked a couple of teams over in the Glidden area where we had our own museum for five years. Obviously, this is late spring, and this is the garden, and nothing's come up yet. Well, uh, we've just gotten our garden in. It's been a little wet this spring, and I put potatoes and onions in yesterday, and we have parsnips and turnips to go in yet today. Are there any special techniques that you use that the other gardeners of Iowa would not be using? Well, nothing in particular. Of course, it's uh, not fertilized or anything. And all hand spaded and all this? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> we uh, still use the old way here. <laughs> now, as far as this area over in here, what do you have? Well, this area over here is our uh, place where we do the uh, shingle making and saw our firewood and uh, just generally work with the wood over here. Do the people enjoy coming out? What about the little children? Uh, I think they especially enjoy it. Uh, they get to see some things that they're maybe not aware of before, and uh, I think that uh, they do enjoy it. Do you plan to stay? Well, I've been here three years, so... <laughs> <laughs> and you now see the cabin that's about two years old that was built by Darwin Tatey, and if you come to visit the Living History Farm, perhaps you will see him work over a period of time and see the results of part of the work. And thank you, Darwin. Thank you. In order to get to the Living History Farms, take the Hickman Road exit for I-35 and I-80, that's Interstate 35 and Interstate 80, exit number 32. If you're driving out of Des Moines directly, take Hickman Road. The address is really 2600 Northwest 111th Street, 
but that is Hickman Road if it went that far. Four opportunities this summer have been offered for attending special festivals. The summer special events are Crafts Festival, May the 12th and 13th, 50th anniversary of the Department of Agriculture, June the 23rd, the Grain Harvest Festival in late July, and the Corn Harvest Festival, October the 6th. If you want more information concerning these events, or if you wish to visit at other times, contact Chet Randolph, Executive Director. His address is Living History Farm, 2600 Northwest 111th Street in Des Moines, with a zip code of 50322, and the telephone number is 278-8936. It is listed in the Des Moines phone directory.